met her first in, in Normandy a couple of years ago, and we really hit it off. I admire her very greatly. She's a very gracious person. She's a very intelligent person. She adores her grandfather, although she does recognize he had some flaws that uh, don't mean a thing. We met again today and talked at length, and uh, she wanted me to keep in touch. She wants to meet again in Normandy next year, so we'll see what happens. It looked like a, actually a working farm of the 50s. It wasn't pretentious, and his lifestyle was not anything out of the ordinary for people in his position at that time. They didn't live high on the hog, from the looks of it. They were not people that uh, didn't appear to lionize themselves. They just appeared to be ordinary people in their living style. And that's what he was through the war, too. He, he didn't put on any airs, and he uh, was very much like the common soldier, really, except he was in an administrative position, and he was absolutely the best person they could ever pick for that position. He was not really a military person in, in the ordinary sense of the word, such as, I, as, as uh, some of the other leaders, but he was a person who could make people work together. People thought he was a laid-back guy, didn't know what was going on. In fact, that was talked about by a lot of people at the time. But he had a terrible temper, which he didn't show in public. But when he was negotiating with the rest of the staff, they knew he meant business when he talked. And he didn't shy away from making decisions. No matter how hard those decisions were, he made them for the right reasons. Well, of course, we never knew him at all until, because he was in an administrative position in most of his military life up till that point, under Douglas MacArthur. Uh, it didn't take long for the public to see that this was a man to be reckoned with. He could make decisions. He didn't have a problem. He was looking at the long view. And the people went to him because he also had that common touch. He didn't put on the airs. You felt you could go in and ha shake his hand or talk to him. He was that kind of person. People thought he was a bumbling president, played golf and didn't know what was going on. People were, didn't understand him at all. He did marvelous things for this country. And he didn't put on the airs and brag about it, but they, he got it accomplished. It's been a long time since we've had a person of that character, and that character. He drew us together, kept us together. We'd been fighting and feuding with ourselves and our leaders. He put that to rest. He didn't make a big thing of it. He just did it. And everybody liked him for that reason. He came from a very humble background, farming background. He could have put on airs like a king, but he never did it. And that's one of the things everybody really liked. Part of the time I was on farm, we never owned a farm, but we lived on farms. And I was exposed to that life and I loved it. And my relatives had farms and I was oftentimes over there. I lived a lot in cities and I appreciated some of that, but I, city life was not really for me. And when I, get out of the service even before uh, I determined I would have a piece of land where I could raise my family and my kids could do what they want. And I talked about it so much that it became a joke in the company. And when we'd go into an operation to come out, somebody would say, where's so-and-so? Oh, he bought the farm. That's where it started. And we did farm. I worked in a shop and we had We'd raise eight to 10 beef cattle a year. We'd keep one for ourselves and sell the others. We had 75 sheep. We raised land raised pigs. We had a milk cow. My wife, we determined she would stay home and raise the kids and I would work. So I worked 50 to 60 hours a week, always. She milked the cow, made the butter and made the cheese. The pig got what was left. 
Uh, we raised big garden, canned everything. We picked berries, made jelly. Blackberries, she'd get up in the morning at five o'clock before the kids got up, go out and pick three or four gallons of berries and I'd take them in the next day and sell them. You won't believe it for 10 cents a gallon. That's how we did. Well, it's important because times have changed. We don't have that kind of living today and those kinds of people. So it's nice to have it to go there and reflect upon it. Especially, I feel strongly that school children should go to those places. We live too long, artificial a life. And this brings us back to our roots, these places that you people are doing now and show us now. And it is, it does get to you when you see it. And all of these guides you have, they're marvelous. It's wonderful to talk to them. And they're very passionate about what they do. And I think it's money well spent. We volunteered for this. Remember at that time, none of us had been in an airplane. Very few people at that time had ever been out of their own county. There was no reason to go. And nobody had any money to go anyway. There was also a certain mystique. This was sold to us on that basis, romanticized. We found a mistake in the romantics lasted about 10 seconds from the plane to the ground. And the rest of the time, that was gone. But we did volunteer for it. We got trained for it, and we got paid for it. That does not make you a hero. A hero is someone who does something out of character with no training, no expectation of getting it in it anything personal. And I, I said this so long, I think it's getting old, but it's true. You read in the paper week after week, there's a big wreck, or somebody drives a car in a pond. There's people going to work in suits, jump out, never think of their own safety, and run in and save those people. Those are heroes. And I class soldiers, EMTs, firemen, policemen, and the same thing. We're all the same kind of people. And that does not make you a hero. Now bravery, I can't think of anything more brave than a fireman going in a burning building to rescue someone. And look how many of them would lose. We lost soldiers, but we were expected to lose soldiers. It was drummed into us on our training. You are shock troops and you are expendable. That's what you're taught. People have asked me, well, don't you feel bad when you see your people get killed? To tell you the truth, I have to say, unless it's somebody particularly close to you, you don't. After the first few you see, it doesn't make any difference. It's just something that happens. People that join special units like ours and all the special units you see today are attractive to people who are not emotional. We are that kind of people. We do not show our emotions openly, usually. And if you can't do that, you don't belong in those units. No different than it did before. It feels even easier because there's no danger. You're not being shot at, and there's no pressure to it. It's just something you do. Uh, that's a thing people have asked me, don't you get an adrenaline rush? Like the, I said, no, these skydivers do it. People that ride motorcycles regularly, they get it. They have to live with that kind of a rush. Sports people are the same way. People like me are not, but we don't get that rush. We do it pragmatically. Now, the reason I did it this time, there's several reasons. One's ego. I'm telling people, look, I may be old as hell, but I can still do what I did before. And the other is, many people particularly in Europe, were asking me to do this. And the 70th anniversary was a big celebration and they wanted to see somebody do it and that's why I did it. And I was fortunate enough to have a wonderful French demonstration unit allow me to jump with them. That really is quite an honor.